Welcome to Galaxy Brains. An infinite amount of cash. cash. I'm your host, Alex Thorne. The U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. Bitcoin made a new all-time high. If you're not long, if you're not long, you're short. Satoshi's going to come on there, laugh hysterically, go quiet. All Bitcoin's going to be erased. Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the best crypto asset. Bitcoin is going to zero. Welcome back. Bitcoin, not zero. Down a little bit since last week, but not definitely not zero. Hey, thanks for listening to Galaxy Brains. You probably heard our new intro. Shout out to Phineas, my homie, and his awesome team for making that. Um, we're going to transition to a little bit of a new format. I know. Uh, no rap intro going forward, but that doesn't mean that I won't rap sometimes. I told Phineas when we first met, you know, you put me in front of a mic long enough and He's going to rap. So, um, you know, maybe in the middle or at the end of an episode, if warranted. But going forward, I think this is going to be our new intro, and I really like it. What do you think, Finn? Is it time? I mean, we did like 60-plus raps, intro raps or something. It's the evolution of a show. It's the next phase. I think mu what's cool about it is music will always be baked into the identity of Galaxy Brains. Yeah. And that's part of it. So there's going to be music within it. We're going to still rap. There's going to be we'll we'll do bigger projects and we'll make it interesting, but right, yeah. I mean, I think it's just a new the new chapter. We're trying something different, and this intro I think is representative of the show in many ways and of the personality of the show. And right. I'm excited, yeah, I am too. Um, I love this intro too. Uh, just if you're keeping score at home, I think the, in, in order, if I remember them all, it opens with Neil Kashkari, a, a Fed governor, saying the Fed has infinite cash. Then Jay Powell, the Fed chairman, saying the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. Mike, uh, it was some clips from me introducing myself in there. Mike Novogratz saying, if you're not long, you're short. Uh, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of the world's largest bank, uh, J.P. Morgan, saying that Satoshi is going to come back and laugh hysterically and then erase all the Bitcoin. It, that was in response to Joe Kiernan once on, on Squawk saying, no, we do know that there will only ever be 21 million. Uh, I don't know. Jamie thinks there's like an Easter egg somewhere in there that will like undo that at the end. At the end. Um, great quote, Satoshi. Um, and then we got Michael Saylor, of course. And uh, I don't know the other last guy's name that says Bitcoin's going to zero, but it's just a funny clip. <laughs> um, it's a really, I mean, I think many of our listeners will know all of the references within the intro. We were talking about yeah. this, but I think, you know, a lot of our new listeners may not. And, you know, you put on some cool turntablism over one of my beats. I always like the sound of that. Yeah, it's um, your beat. Yeah. yeah, it's your beat. Um, hey, before we get into the rest of the show, I got to remind you to please refer to the link to the disclaimer in the podcast notes and note that none of the information in this podcast contact constitutes investment advice or an offer recommendation or solicitation by Galaxy Digital or any of its affiliates to buy or sell any securities. Um, hey, let's just get this rolling, Phineas. What do you say? Let's go to our friend Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Trading. Let's go now to our friend Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Trading. Bimnet, welcome as always to Galaxy Brands. Thanks for having me and welcome back from London. Thank you. Yes, I was traveling. Uh, I went to Cheat Code in London, Peter McCormack. So we got the real Bedford FC uh, banner over here. A uh, very fun conference. Um, shout out to And the now you're team. a real football fan. I am. I've seen actual football be played. Um, it was great. I am back, though. And while I was in London, however, um, there was a geopolitical event. That's weighed on markets. If you look over my shoulder, you see the block clock. It, you know, Again, it's funny to be saying this at like 61K, but like I look at it. I see the number. I say to myself, bad number. It should be higher number. Anyway, let's we'll debate about why what uh, the causes were of that. But first, I know there's been a lot of, so there's been macro news and, and broader markets have been sliding as well now for several weeks, I think, right? Yep. What's going on? So one, um, in terms of sort of US monetary policy, um, you've had a series of, of strong data prints with CPI, PPI, and those strong data prints have caused the Fed to kind of react um, and more specifically, uh, they the commentary from Fed officials ha has moved from three cuts is appropriate this year, and that was what was in the dot plot, to two, to one, um, and, and now you're kind of pricing in like one and a half cuts this year all in, and we started the year at seven. So the combination of this hawkish Fed speak uh, and hot data um, has led to a major repricing in the U.S. interest rate curve, mm -hmm. um, and yields uh, across the entirety of, of the U.S. yield curve have, have all moved higher. Um, and as a consequence, uh, the dollar has you know gained uh, 
a, a lot of value, uh, particularly against EM countries like dollar China, dollar Korea, do dollar Max. G10 currency pairs are, are also been moving lower. Euro broke through 107, almost got through 106. And on top of that, uh, what you're seeing in, in U.S. equity markets is also fairly notable. We've had you know breaks of the 50-day moving averages, basically three weeks of, of, of moving sideways and then down. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that weakness in equities is attributable to the, the bond uh, price action. But there's another component to it, which I think is, is also very relevant, uh, which is kind of the deterioration of the U.S. consumer in a way, and the subsequent and likely deterioration of earnings, right? Uh, there was a company today, a freight uh, company, um, and they basically were like, this quarter, our, our, you know, our loads are, are down, oh, wow. um, and their expenses are also high huh. because of things like commodities car insurance, and, yeah. commodities, energy prices, and so their margins are getting squeezed because people want less stuff, and in order to do the exact same activity, the costs of, of that has, has gone up. And there are, also, there are also a couple of consumer discretionary companies, retailers, um, that have given guidance recently. And that guidance has been not so great. And so there's actually genuine concern about the U.S. consumer. Wow. But hadn't the consumer been remarkably strong for They had a while. been remarkably strong. However, yeah. what's happening is inflation's actually starting to take a bite from their ability to consume. Right. And what that's related to is basically uh, what I like to think of necessity inflation. Right. What are some of the components that are rising the hottest right now? Home, home uh, insurance. Car insurance, medical costs. Things are like in many cases mandated by law to buy. Correct. Right. Um, you literally also ga gas prices. Yes. Right. We're all yeah. You're you're feeling it. Look, you look at like the Big Mac index. That's up a lot more than than headline CPI. No, I, and I don't want to pick on them in specific. But remember the, the there was the there was the five dollar foot long, and now there's the six dollar six inch. It's, <laughs> that's it's, inflation. That's more expensive, <laughs> and it's half. Uh, the, 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 no, it really is so true good. though. That's literally the sandwich that like yeah. To be clear, that's how like, I measure my inflation. The subway. I mean, I'm just saying, off. like it used to be a, a dollar, uh, five dollars for twelve for a giant 12 one, and now yeah, it's more expensive six. for half as much. Yes. Um, but yes, yeah, so people are feeling it in food too. Yeah. yeah. And so what's happening is that you know discretionary spending that's taking a hit. Yeah. And people are already at sort of like lower savings rate and lower saving base in the U.S. because people have just been consuming so much and so much. <laughs> and wages uh, aren't keeping up yeah. with, with inflation anymore. So they're and running out some... of money. Yes. They're not buying as much, so the earnings Correct. can be bad. But at the same time, inflation is still actually now rising again. Correct. So they can't cut as much, yeah. which means risk is gonna has been going down. It's Correct. pretty like it's not a good picture. It's not great. I, I want to give you your laurels a little bit here too. I think I mentioned this on last week's pod, but you've been saying for months that they shouldn't. It shouldn't have been seven cuts. Yeah. Um. At the time, I recall you saying, "Well, first of all, just like even when the data was much better, you're like, there's there's no need for the cuts. Like the economy is doing well. Um. And it's almost like, well, maybe maybe you you would. It, they're get this is where they start to get in the rock and the hard place really bad, right? Because it's like, well, if the economy, the real economy, the everyday people. The, their costs, like the their their for their rent, their houses, their food, like maybe they need some relief, and like that could be cuts. But yeah. if you cut, maybe inflation, inflation goes higher. Back. Yeah. So they're dealing with uh, an insane credibility issue right now. And so when Powell came out and was like, "Oh, we're still cutting three, and we're like, "It doesn't really make any sense to cut three, right? Like. The market is starting to challenge their credibility, and the way you see it challenged in, in markets is you know, some of this interest rate pricing, but what I like to look at as well is inflation sort of uh, expectations mm -hmm. and market-based mm -hmm. inflation expectations. And basically, over the past couple of months, you've seen uh, implied inflation tick, tick higher and higher. Um, and so the market was basically like calling you know, the Fed's bluff in a way, being like, Guys, like, do you think doing what you're currently doing is going to cause, you know, in inflation to come down? No. The expectations started to, to move higher. And then you start getting into the terminal state of this, right? What does this look like a couple years from now? And the fiscal situation is really insane. <laughs> right now, I heard today that, you know, it's April 20th, right? So we we're probably 150 days into the year or something like that. Yeah. And the deficit's already one and a half trillion dollars. We're, I think, on pace for something like four. No, like two and a half 
on the year, oh, yeah, which yeah. is still a lot, a lot. And I think that's what you're kind of seeing in uh, like commodity prices right now. The gold, the silver charts are some of the most compelling things I've ever seen. Silver is about to be at a five, I think it's around a five year high and it's breaking out. Gold yeah. is obviously at fresh all time highs. And that's in the face of a way stronger dollar, much higher real rates. Um, and so you're seeing that correlation breakdown that we all we you know we yeah, talk about, about in this. the context of Bitcoin. Yeah. But you're seeing that correlation breakdown in gold. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And like I'm literally I mean, the world is basically like avoiding or dumping U.S. debt or or buying asking for you know for it to be cheaper. Protection. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. While paying more for gold. I mean, they're, they're yes. Yeah. And and there are central banks buying this stuff. Like right. why it's so compelling is that. These central banks that have money printers are using those money printers to buy real assets yeah. like gold and silver. Huh. Um, and so that's why, like, if Bitcoin, like, if it is going to be in that realm of assets, real money, debasement hedges, it's got such a promising future. Right. Because the macro world is freaking out right now, and that's why gold is yeah. – is ripping. All right, let's talk about Bitcoin and, mm. and the crypto complex too, because I mean, Bitcoin is at these prices maybe like eighteen or twenty percent off its all time high, which was seventy three eight or so. I guess only several weeks ago, I've written about this. That's actually extremely common during the major bull runs we've seen. Twenty like, thirty percent correct. Yeah, like yeah. seven or eight of them sometimes, yeah. right? Like so, like okay, like for context, that's fine. Also, it has dipped historically before the halving, which is you know just a day or two away. Um, but also. The the geopolitics, the Iranian uh, retaliatory uh, missile attack on yes. Israel happened last Saturday. All the other world's markets are closed, basically. Um, but Bitcoin was open and it it dropped significantly right on the headline. Right. Correct. And um, but then I would say the market opened on on Monday. Eventually, you know, it was like so yeah. did like Bitcoin. It, it was how much of this. Obviously, we sort of trending you know, below all time highs before. But like, you know, is this a reaction to uh, it's a risk asset? I am able to sell it over Correct. the weekend. And then Bitcoin sort of str struggling to recover from that sale up in the 68, 69 area because people are like, well, maybe it was a little overheated. I mean, wh how do you think about where Bitcoin is or is or is it sort of just kind of noise? It's still at this point. I mean, no, I, I mean, to I, be clear, it's 61K is a nice, healthy, I mean, I high think, Bitcoin I, price. But. I think last year we were here this time and we were talking it's like 22. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's obviously had a huge run. Yeah. And that basically highlights the fact that there's a lot of long positioning in, in the asset. Yeah. And so I think what you've, you've had over the past couple of weeks is just a healthy flush out of positioning consolidation you know there was a large hands leverage going into, wipe out that, strong hands. yeah a lot of leverage came off yeah yeah and so i think the the trend is, is still intact um and i'm looking at you know something like the 100 day moving average to kind of confirm to me that we're still right. uh trending um higher um and that's right around 57k so you still have a ton of room um, and a lot of people have said like 58 is a is a reasonable like that would also make sense like yeah, no, totally you just look reasonable. at the charts and stuff and but. i and i think like you know sometimes it's better to look at the big picture charts like look at the monthly candles yeah. uh, and stuff and you know not get too caught up in in the day to day noise and it is it's, funny cuz like if you look at like i said if you look at 61 and and you say oh my gosh that we're down yeah like you said, I mean, we were doing this pod in January 23. It was 16 6 or something, I think, in the first episode of the year last year. So, like, I mean, you know, yeah, and it's now just we have psychology a whole new buyer that people think about. Like, it. tons of like ETF inflows, more people interested than ever. And, and a lot of those platforms that we've been talking about being mm -hmm. the main net new accessible market, like the wealth advisors and the financial advisor platforms, they're still not turned on. Yeah. So, but, but it does seem like those flows, just on the flows, we saw some incredible inflows. I think something like uh, 14 or so billion in in inflows, net inflows, um, not including or you know net of the grayscale outflows. That was before any of those platforms turned on. So I guess we assume. I mean, not that they weren't all institutions, but they were just bought, people buying institutions too, but retail on like brokerage platforms, basically. Yep. Um, those have really sort of dried up over. It, I mean, it's been less every week for like the last right. four weeks. So has everyone now? <laughs> this is an impossible question to ask, but it leads me to ask: Has any everyone now that apparently did want to get it through their brokerage account and could and did, like, is there's no more dry powder there? It seems like retail has has allocated. Yeah, no, I think historically, if you look, you know, some of this. 
flow activities related to tax season and That's stuff. True. And so, you know, typically I do think you start to see an uptick in retail involvement in risk markets in terms of like equity inflows yeah. and stuff. Um, so there's a case to be made that, um, yeah, the people that got access to it have allocated already, but there's still so many people that don't have access that so many platforms that haven't been turned on, right. you know, vanguards of the world. So I mean, sort of like, like wave one maybe has played out wave, a little wave bit one, and like possible. wave two is yet to happen. Like, yeah, maybe yeah. at the end of the day. I mean, it's like, you just have to think about what your trade is when you're buying Bitcoin and your trade is short dollars. Yeah. And I'm um, happily short dollars. There you go. Bimnet Abibi, my friend from Galaxy Trading. Thanks for coming to Galaxy Brands. Thank you. Let's go now to our guest, Sam Callahan, Senior Analyst at Swan. Sam, welcome to Galaxy Brands. Thanks, Alex. Long time listener since uh, day one, man. Wow. You might be the yeah. only one. <laughs> I, th- I like to think we've gotten better at it since the, since day one. Actually, don't go back and listen to the first couple episodes. They were, <laughs> we were finding our footing. Um, dude, Sam, I'm super, signal. Yeah, I'm super happy to have you on. Uh, I love your show, Swan Signal, also. Um, so, and, and you're one of the more intelligent analysts, I think. And, and I would say like, um, like me- measured analysts uh, covering Bitcoin and macro and the interplay between the two. Um, we've got a f- bunch of fun topics we want to discuss, but let's Let's start with just the Bitcoin price. It's what, 61K as we record today on April 17th. That's like maybe 20% off that new all time high of 73.8 or so. Um, and and it's just about to be the halving. You know, big question where are we in the cycle? Is that still a thing? Are we early? Did we speed run the cycle? What are your thoughts about how Bitcoin is trading like over the last period and where you think we might be? I said, for context, I said a, uh, a couple of weeks ago that we might be in the late third inning. I don't, again, that's like mm-hmm. literally back of the napkin, like just made that up, but it felt like we weren't early, but we weren't late. Yeah, it does kind of feel like we're kind of in the middle somewhere. I mean, that's kind of what I would say. I I understand why people might think that we're farther along than maybe uh, the general market participants think, because like, even if you look at the round trip from like, you know, previous all time high back to previous all time high, it took like 470 days, uh, to get back to the previous all time high this time, uh, previous cycles, that was like over 700 days. And so we really kind of pushed ahead. Part of that's the ETFs, obviously the large amount of demand that came in from those. So I think there's like, uh, and there's a lot of speculation too. I mean, like there was a moment there around like the micro strategy when it was hitting like 1800, Mm -hmm. a lot of speculation, a lot of uh, exuberance. There was a lot of meme coin action that's like flying off, there's airdrops. And so if I'm just looking at this anecdotally and just like trying to get those, uh, you know, alarm bells ringing when I see like the behavior that resembles kind of like maybe a local top, yeah. I think the signs were there. And so like a pullback is completely normal in a bull market. I mean, I know you've covered this too. There's multiple, you know, 20% plus drops, I think like five or six or seven. I mean, you would know better than me in the previous cycles during bull markets. So it's completely normal. And I do think we had some like toppy behavior and need a little bit of a cleanse. And I think that's healthy. I think periods of consolidation are healthy to wipe out leverage, you know, any kind of short-term traders that were coming in just trying to make a quick buck. Uh, they're kind of getting carted off with this volatility that's ex- been extremely choppy. Yeah. And as we go into the halving, um, it's kind of done what I expected. It's kind of rallied into the halving, like previous halvings. Um, I think it's up like a, a hundred over 150% in the last 360 days. And that's kind of in line with previous halvings leading up to it. And then typically it does well afterwards. Um, we can get, I'll kind of stop there about kind no, of what I think afterwards, but I, I want to hear your thoughts too. No, I, I think mean, that's right. I mean, I, I I love your point. I totally agree. Like the tons of new token launches, like people launching tokens on Bitcoin that by definition can't actually even have utility in like the DeFi sense, right? Like you can't build a, a DEX on Bitcoin layer one. So your BRC20 token by definition can't be a utility token to put into that DEX, like to operate it, right? Um, let alone like all the like straight up meme coins like that historically you would think is sort of like far out on the risk curve, like late cycle activity. Um, And so I, yeah, I I agree. Part of me thinks it's one way I think about that is that like in the past that's been late cycle activity because so many new entrants come in and they like get interested in things like Dogecoin that aren't as like fundamental. They're, They're easier to understand, understand, but they're like, 
you know, it's sort of something that like newbies tend to do, whereas it kind of felt to me like particularly starting in the fall, the sort of growth of meme coins was actually kind of like a cynicism from the existing crypto natives who made it this far. Like they weren't excited anymore by like DeFi, like tokens. They weren't they weren't out here talking about Web3, but they were like, you know what, like this is like straightforward. We can get behind just like making jokes on the blockchain. And and so maybe that counters a little bit the idea that I don't think I personally don't think, although I've heard of some of this activity increasing lately, but that it's like such and such as friend or their barber, like being like, how do I buy meme coins yeah. on Solana? I don't feel like we're there yet. So um, and then, of course, the ETFs, I still think they frankly have like the the we talked we talked about this, I think, on your show, like there's no um, the the advisor platforms aren't even here yet. Like so like there presumably should be a, a pile of latent demand to still come that can drive additional inflows, I think, going forward personally. Yeah, no. Um, now I did put out a great report uh, actually this morning about the having, and uh, and I read it, and I actually found myself agreeing with it, you know. There's this one chart that I love, and it just talks about how each successive having has a diminished e effect when you just take into account the daily trading volumes. Right. And so this current having, um, you know, it's it's going to be 450 Bitcoin, which is like 31 million dollars at a price of 70,000 Bitcoin, and that only makes up like 59 basis points of the daily trading volume. Now the first having, uh, Nidig highlighted that that was over 10 percent uh, back then. So like it just has a diminishing effect. And so they were like, you know, I, I think the having actually has a minimal impact on price, um, from the supply side, it's actually going to be more from the demand side, from the ETFs, that latent demand that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. I agree with Nidic. I mean, that's how I feel as well. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, but the one thing that I would say as a caveat is narratives are really powerful in markets. And so, if people believe that the the having has the supply shock and it gets run with it and mainstream media is talking about the having, everyone's saying the having's coming. I mean, it will have an impact. There's going to yeah. be a lot of trading activity. There's going to be volatility. Um, I could see it sell off, uh, you know, initially that wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, really nothing would surprise me because if people believe it, uh, it doesn't matter what I just said that it's only, you know, a small amount of the daily trading volume, uh, people will trade it and they'll buy it because they think it's going to go up. So it's mm -hmm. one of those things. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. About I do that, think but. it's like a quadrennial marketing event. It's such a good way to learn about how Bitcoin works, to learn about the having. Um, you, you should, it should be inherently bullish as an event, just that it did occur. But I think it honestly, Bitcoin's so well known look globally that like no one would be surprised that it did occur. It won't be like, oh my gosh, look at it. it the programmatic like change did work, right? Like everybody expects it to work because it it will work and it has always happened. Well, you know, this is only the fourth one. Um, but yeah, I think of it as like, there's a lot more people learning about Bitcoin. There's a great opportunity to teach and learn about Bitcoin. You've got way bigger, mature entrants in this market that are doing that teaching. Um, I definitely agree with the point you made from um, Nidig, I've, I've written this too, that like as a percentage of daily float, it's frankly minimal. Um, another report I saw this morning from Kareem Helmy at Thane Field Research, uh, that he was looking at minor selling pressure and um, his his thesis, and he, it was dated back this up, you can find this on Twitter, like he, he tweeted the report. And basically that just like miners are actually like their their margins are quite healthy right now. And so they're not actually selling, they're, that what selling they've, they're mostly doing is is mostly discretionary. And so like, on the on the i guess anti-bullish side that like oh there'll be much less minor selling to be clear we already pointed out like it's not that much anyway like as a percentage of the daily trading volume but like also like they won't have to all of a sudden like they they can absorb a 50 percent decline in revenue a lot of them at least in terms mm -hmm. of their break-even uh, operating yeah. cost to mine a bitcoin yeah i agree i think i actually might see a, a little bit less of a you know drop in hash rate than people expect and mm -hmm. difficulty uh if you look at the break-even rates of these rigs, I mean, I think he's spot on. And and uh, I, honestly, this price run-up has been great for miners. I mean, right. we have had you know the revenues with the fees. You know, that was something for a while. It might actually in, in the coming weeks that might spike back up. We'll we'll kind of see. Um, but there's reasons to believe. You know, when you just look at like hash price and some of these things, some of these factors they're in a better shape. And then especially compared to like you know 2022 in terms of their balance sheets. I mean, it's it's like night and day. And um, so in terms of like just the health of their balance sheet. Some of them have a lot of cash uh, on hand to maybe do some M&A uh, activity after the halving. And 
right? It's just, it's a different, it's a totally different environment right now. And so that, you know, I kind of spoke about this, which is like the interesting thing with the having to me is that like Darwinian effect on the mining industry to kind of wipe out uh, inefficient actors. I think it's beautiful. I think it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it actually causes them to become more efficient over time as a whole industry. Um, and, and that's what the having really does. I mean, it, it's going to all that capital and all those resources are going to get shifted to better operators with cheaper sources of energy, with more efficient mining operations. And they're going to, it causes them to search for even cheaper sources of energy, stranded sources of energy, uh, innovate, uh, do things like, you know, uh, waste, you know, go to the waste fields and try to get energy from there, you know, yep. burn tires, you know, do, you know, you do these really creative ways to get cheap energy. And, and, and so that's what the having really does in my mind. And that's what I find really fascinating about it. Um, kind of be outside the price that everyone else has right. to focus on. Yeah, I agree. Um, love those thoughts. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, some comments that were made because it jives with, um, the, you know, one of the big drawdowns, you know, like you said, there's been a lot of volatility and there's reasons why, um, you know, it's to be expected that, you know, you, just, you don't go up forever anyway, but last weekend, um, there was Iran had a retaliatory strike on Israel. I think their first time ever directly themselves attacking Israel on Saturday. And this caused the created significant jitters in the world around geopolitical risk and what might come. And but, you know, of course, all markets were closed except Bitcoin and Bitcoin, you know, <laughs> dropped 10 percent in like, you know, five minutes after this happened. And um, you had mentioned, and I am recalling that Andrew Ross Sorkin from CNBC had said, well, wait a second, isn't it supposed to trade like a hedge? Like, isn't it supposed to be something that you buy, uh, you know, during times of war? And what, what was your take on on his comment? And like, how, how did you view Bitcoin's reaction to that event? Well, um, you know, I was reminded of a quote from Morgan Housel, and that was, you know, every investor is making a bet on the future, every single one of them. It's only called speculation uh, when you disagree with them or on their time horizon. And so that's what I would say to Andrew Ross Sorkin is like, um, obviously, when markets happen, there's always a knee jerk response and investors are going to sell what's the most liquid. And like you said, Bitcoin trades over the weekend and it's liquid and it's available to sell. And it's usually the first to respond to events like this, especially when they happen outside of trading hours. And but really what you got to do is zoom out and say like, what would, uh, you know, rising, uh, you know, geopolitical conflicts or tensions, you know, how would that be beneficial or undermine Bitcoin's long-term value proposition? And when you think about war, I mean, war is highly inflationary. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, just when you look at things like a disruption in supply chains or a breakdown in trade relations, it just adds friction, which leads to rising cost of goods, uh, you know, rising gasoline prices, you know, rising commodity prices across the board, which leads to inflationary pressures. And then you have the spending. I mean, the spending, wars are expensive. Government spending really spikes in all wars. I, I, I did some study a couple years ago looking into this when you, uh, Ukraine was invaded by Russia. During the Civil War, the U.S. debt was $65 million. By the end of the war, it was $2.6 billion. That's almost a 40-fold increase. During World War II, here's a stat. Like, if you spent... 100 million per day, 365 days a year, every single hour, you spent $1 million for 365 days a year, it would take you 576 years to spend what we spent in during World War II. And so government spending spikes. And how do they do that? They do it through currency devaluation, they print the money, or they borrow the money. I mean, you can raise taxes, but we don't do that anymore. We either borrow the money, or we devalue the currency. And so you don't want to hold that. You want to hold hard, scarce assets. And that's what, when you look at the data, you know, bonds don't really perform well. You don't want to own the thing that they're going to be flooding with new supply as they borrow money to fund their war efforts. And cash does really poor. You don't want to own the thing they're devaluing. You want to own hard, scarce assets. And so if I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin, I would say zoom out and think about the actual long-term implications of what's going on here because you're going to want to hold hard-ass scarce sets in that uh environment so that's what yeah, i would say I, then. that makes sense and 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 you know let's uh, along the same lines you're talking about not wanting to own bonds for example and and we have flooded the market with new treasury issuance in general i mean it's like crazy the amount of fiscal spend yeah. that the government is doing in general right i've seen the stat that's like 
uh, you know, adding a trillion to the deficit to the national debt every hundred days. Um, there's been a you, you raised this chart with me that that gold and bonds. I guess that we should say yields, but like in, on an inverse, the value of bonds has been declining while the gold price has been increasing. And for for like literally decades, they traded the same because in times of crisis, U.S. debt was thought to be a really good hedge. But now, like in mass, you know, or at least on on the margins, people are selling debt and buying gold. What does that tell you? Yeah, it's like this breakdown in this relationship between the inverted real yields and and gold and it's it's really fascinating because it's me it just shows like either there's going to be a reversion to the mean um and gold's going to break down maybe <laughs> or uh that relationship's changing and gold sniffing out something and bitcoin's doing something similar people were like you know bitcoin won't do well in a rising interest rate environment but here we are bitcoin's ripping at the end of 2023 and 2024 in a high interest rate environment and um, I think both of those things are very similar. And it's it's towards this increased awareness of the unsustainable nature of the fiscal situation. I mean, you're not even just hearing it from Bitcoin. You're actually hearing Bitcoin or arguments in the mainstream from even the people at the CBO or uh, Jerome Powell himself saying unsustainable. Mm-hmm. The IMF came out yesterday and they just said something's got to give here in terms of the U.S. fiscal situation. And so... Um, you know, I think that's what Bitcoin and gold are really sniffing out. And it doesn't really matter as much what the Fed's going to do with interest rates, because if they raise interest rates, it increases the interest expense um, and blasts open the fiscal deficit even more. And so it got it actually worsens the fiscal situation. And if they lower rates, you know, that's going to be beneficial for asset prices and things are going to get go up there. That's inflationary as well. And so there's inflationary pressures across the board for the Fed if they keep interest rates high, if they jack interest rates down, same thing happens. And I think gold and Bitcoin are sniffing that out. And the last thing I'll say is the Fed, you know, the Fed has said multiple times that it has surgical tools to deal with like, uh, you know, financial instability concerns, whether that's like liquidity in the treasury market, they have surgical tools they can use. (laughs) And so they don't even have to touch the interest rates you know, they can do something else like the bank term funding program or, you know, the reverse repo is getting drained down right now. Or, you know, the Treasury can come over and do something with the Treasury general account. All of those are like inadvertently uh, inflationary in the end without touching the interest rate policy. So that's potentially why you're seeing this divergence because gold is like, I don't really care as much anymore about this interest rate policy. You're going to do other things that are inflationary and it's actually just a worsening fiscal situation. And I'm totally diverting now uh because this is a new like regime change that we're in right now and so those are my thoughts around that but it's it's a yeah. fascinating chart it is i i love the way you say sniffing out because it, it it really feels now that in the investing community again bitcoin aside that you know it used to be like doom saying gold bugs that were like banging the table about like government debt and unsustainable dad and fiscal, you know, malprudence and, and, and the fed printing money. Like that was like, you know, these doomsayers that were, you know, right. Like a broken clock is right twice a day. Like, but now it, it doesn't feel like they're fringe at all. In fact, you, Jamie Dimon has said that he's the CEO of the largest bank in the world has said that something is, is wrong that has to change. Right. And so it yeah. seems like it's straight up consensus now that the U S government is terrible at managing money. Right. And that like something that, and, and so now it's no longer in, in anyway. So like that, that's a real shift. Yeah. It's, it had me thinking like, you know, whenever something becomes consensus, it's usually not a great thing if, for your you know investments. <laughs> and it's the first time I've heard like really Bitcoin or, narratives really start to take hold uh, from notable people in traditional finance. I mean, you you know, they might as well be Bitcoiners the way that they're speaking about the fiscal situation, the money printing. Uh, It's something that Bitcoiners have been talking about for years and gold bugs to their credit. Um, Right. You know, and uh, but now it's like the awareness is really the last like two months or so. You've seen a lot of people. Ken Griffin come out. um, You've Larry Fink came out, uh, said something similar. You, you mentioned Jamie Dimon, Jerome yeah. Powell. I mean, it just goes, the list goes on. Right. I mean, Jay, Jay Powell, th- this is one of the things Bim Net Abibi has been like effectively like criticizing Jay Powell about is like, you know, he's getting asked these questions during the FOMC press conferences and he can't say what everyone knows, which is like, 
the fiscal impulse is a huge part of this because he's yeah. trying so hard to maintain like independence so that he's not like, you know, criticizing the federal government and, and instead he's focusing on, you know, the dual mandate of the Fed, which doesn't include policing or commenting on government spending, right? It, it, it involves supporting the economy through employment and, um, and inflation, right? For, you know, keeping inflation down. Um, but they, I mean, it was, it shouldn't have been like a monumental thing for him to point out that on 60 minutes, you know, a couple of weeks ago, whenever that was that like, yes, it's ultimately unsustainable. He said, that's pretty much all he said, but it's like, dude, thank you for finally He's acknowledging finally saying it. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's, I mean, again, it's just like, I don't think people can calculate. It's kind of like, it's a little bit like thinking about distances in outer space, like to actually calculate how much money we're talking about. I did some math. Uh, last week, it was like, it's like $200 million added to the national debt, like every 30 minutes or something, it's, which it's, is like a buck 50 per I mean, US it's, household it's every 30 funny, minutes. It's funny money. Yeah. Yeah. It's and like, like, I don't, people have, don't have a real conception of that. Um, yeah. So it does have you looking for something else. It does. And I think, you know, there's education. That's the other thing that's interesting because the US has had so much such a long period of, of, you know, dollar dominance, you know, relative economic prosperity, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And like, you know, improvement of con life conditions and whatnot. Americans are really not prepared to deal with sustained inflation. Whereas there are many other countries where this is like, well known how to deal with this, right? Like you, you get Argentinian pesos yeah. and you immediately buy something with them that hold, will hold yeah, its culturally. value better, right? You dump them immediately. Right. Um, but, Americans don't aren't really used to that. And so I feel like the uptake actually is a little slower on you see it in some of the markets. But like, I don't know a lot of Americans buying gold. I think a lot of that's like foreign actors, central banks that are reducing that's or a, right. So like, when no, are Americans going to learn? No, it's spot on. Um, I, I remember there was a report it looked at. It might have been the biz or, or N bars, but, but it looked at the sensitivity of populations uh, to rising costs of living. And if they had experienced them, you know, recently in their lives, whether that's like one generation prior or two generations prior, they were much more sensitive to price rises, which led to, you know, quicker rates of inflation as they dumped the dollars or whatever local currency it was. Right. And you're right, the United States hasn't really experienced that. And so I think, I think the, the data kind of proves what you just said, which is that there is like a slower you know, realization in, in the United States. It's also like culturally, you know, in other cultures who have dealt with this, they're a little bit more self-sufficient, right? They don't depend on, um, you know, they, they maybe have chickens or something at home. Right, like right, right. You don't have to buy up, everything. Like, you know, you know, yeah, they're, they're culturally, they, they understand that they can't really depend on, you know, stability in the financial system or the monetary system there because they've lived through that. Um, Americans, not so much. So yeah, it's definitely something to keep in mind. You know, we talked, we talked about gold, uh, you know, sort of diverging and sniffing this out. I saw an interview on Fox business, or I guess even a debate, I would call it between Natalie Brunel and Peter Schiff, you know, well-known <laughs> gold uh, lover, Bitcoin hater. I actually got to say, I think he's one of the best posters on twitter.com is his posts are hilariously well, yeah, well-written trolls often. But he's like, he's he's out here actually saying, well, Natalie, the, the price of Bitcoin went down and look at gold. It was up twenty two dollars. Like, how do you square that? Like, why? <laughs> why was that a dumb statement? Will you tell me? Because it sounded it sounded pretty dumb. I mean, look, it's just it's just cherry picking. I mean, I mean, there's no way like he's it's so ridiculous because he's also like it outperformed at two and a half years. And I'm like, well, that's mighty specific time frame, Peter. Like, <laughs> you know, I can do that too. And it's like Bitcoin's outperformed gold three months, six months, one year, two year, four year, five year, six year. It's blown it out of the water. And anybody with a chart and two eyeballs can see that <laughs> yeah. uh, except, except Peter apparently. Yeah. And um, so it's, it's, it's kind of like cherry picking. It's a little disingenuous. Um, he picks like the Pico top of the last bull market, that time frame, and then takes into account the entire bear market, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. he's got to find it because if I like, I said, if I close my eyes and do a dart at a calendar going back 10 years, there's like a 95% chance it lands on a date that Bitcoin outperformed gold over that time frame. <laughs> and I, um, the one thing I'll say that the really interesting thing was when he talks about the intrinsic value of gold, of why, you know, Bitcoin doesn't have intrinsic value and gold does because it's used in like jewelry and electronics and, and, you know, dentistry or whatever. And, 
I just thought it was ridiculous because the very next like sentence is, well, central banks are buying gold. And I was like, well, why are they buying gold? They're, they're buying gold for its monetary properties. You know, most of gold valuation is its monetary premium, not its use cases in, you know, industrial use cases. The central banks are not buying gold because, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're worried about inflation. They're thinking about taking out a second job. They're going to open up a dental practice with their rising gold inventories or they're building electronics in the basement of the central <laughs> banks. It makes no sense. They're buying it for the monetary properties. That's exactly why people are buying Bitcoin, except Bitcoin improves upon some of gold's shortcomings. You know, it's more portable and divisible and, and, and verifiable. Um, and so that's the... That's the value of Bitcoin. It's the same as the value of most of the value of gold. A significant portion of gold's value is tied to its monetary premium. So that just, <laughs> it just gr grinds my gears when, when Peter says that because it's just like so silly. It's like a silly argument. Yeah, there's some cognitive dis dissonance there for sure. Um, I also wanted to ask you, Sam, you've been following the stablecoin thing, and I think it's it's relevant to this whole conversation because we're talking about the value and, and power of the dollar, and you know, I've to, and 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 the uh, ownership of U.S. government debt, and by the way, that's used to spend and the fiscal rights all tied together. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I there was some there's some progress. It looks like perhaps it's early. I mean, who knows whether it's viable, but on on legislation in the U.S. that would formalize and uh, legalize officially stable coins, you know, with, and without, we don't have to talk about the specific details of where that stands, but you know, that state there, the stable coins already today, but I believe under proposed rules basically have to buy treasuries. Um, so that's good because they'd be a net buyer of debt at just the time when we happen to be printing as much of it as we can. Um, how do you yeah. think about stable coins in relation to the dollar, maybe in relation to Bitcoin or crypto markets? Like what, what's interesting to you, if anything, about stable coins and, and American, you know, power? Well, I think you, you touched on it uh, very well. I mean, if they're going to have to keep printing money, which, or, you know, borrowing a lot of money, let's say, and not have the Fed monetize that, but try to find other buyers in the market, um, they're going to need to find, you know, people like stablecoin providers. It's it's ironic because, like, you know, we know Tether owns more treasury bonds than entire countries, right? It's like they're almost in the top 10, I think, in terms of the holdings of their treasuries. And the government's going to need that because if they try to issue a bunch of bonds, they can't let interest rates spike when they do that. They need to find some kind of demand, and the stablecoin providers can do that. Um, but it's it's been really interesting because when I look out, you know, these large international financial institutions um, like the Bank of International Settlements, the IMF, um, the Financial Stability Board, and even, you know, it, the politicians uh, in the United States, they are worried about stable coins much more than Bitcoin. Um, they, t they are focused on stable coins. You know, they're really worried about it being a way for... Um, you know, locals to turn to during periods of instability, which would worsen, you know, a hyperinflation crisis. It would basically cause, it would be an escape hatch for them, make dollars accessible, um, really cause issues for that local central bank and local government uh, if, if people can just escape to stable coins, which they are doing. I mean, the market cap's blown up to over $175 billion. I mean, you can't deny that people want access to dollars um, because it is the, I guess, the best, fiat out there. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. And so the demand is there. And so it's, it's, it's been really interesting because it, their focus isn't on Bitcoin, it's on stable coins. And I, I've read the, the Custodia master account um, order when they were denied. A lot of people thought it was about the fact that they wanted to be a fully reserved bank. And, you know, the Fed didn't want that because it's, we live in a fractional reserve banking system and the fully reserved bank would suck capital out that and it would call it ba banking crisis. And, you know, that wasn't it. When, it. when I read the order, it was really, they didn't want more connections occurring between the crypto asset ecosystem and the traditional financial system. They specifically say their business model focused on crypto. We don't want more connections happening between the traditional financial system. Just look at uh, what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, right? And obviously that's hilarious because, you know, Circle and Silicon Valley Bank, you know, Circle's reserve got stuck on there, but it was because of the instability of the traditional banking system was why that became an issue, not the fact that it was a, a stable coin. 
But the Fed is arguing like, we don't want more connections. Look at that. But then they're also like, we don't like the fact that you are planning to issue a stable coin, your AVITs. And they specifically say, we, um, we have to manage monetary policy. And we don't know how this will impact our ability to do that or impact our balance sheet. And so that was really, you know, a signpost to me because I'm like, people thought it was about the, you know, the fact they were a fully reserved bank. Mm -hmm. They were really concerned about the stable coin. They did not yeah. want more connections and they were concerned about the fact that they were issuing a stable coin. And that's just my takeaway from reading the order. Um, but the stable coin developments, I think we're about to see something, you know, tethers are very, it's out there and I think they're going to try to bring them into compliance. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what the outcome is right now. They're benefiting by owning all those treasuries, collecting that interest and they're buying Bitcoin with it. So that's very interesting dynamics going on, but the yep. way that they are like attacking stable coins, not, not attacking, but they're just very conscientious of what's going on in the stable coin market. Um, I do see, you know, legislation getting passed and them getting brought into more oversight and more compliance and whatever that looks like, I'm not sure. But um, I think that's something that I would bet on for the next, like, let's say, having Epoch. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think I agree. I mean, maybe not like in the next, you know, six to nine months leading into this election, but like in the next two or four years, I think it's almost certain. It seems like yeah. the thing they care almost the most about. And I think it's yeah. basically been positioned as something uh, that they'll also have to deal with KYC illicit finance issues alongside with that. I think they're both the, the, you, I bet you, if we get stablecoin legislation, you'll see something dropped in around um, like surveillance uh, as well uh, for crypto assets broadly. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, hopefully if that happens, it's not something that, you know, kills the industry because it like tries to attack software developers, like some proposals we've seen. Um, yeah. Sam, before we wrap, uh, tell us about Swan and what, what you guys are seeing in the market. Um, like, you know, I've been seeing that Squ Swan is growing a lot. And but like, you know, from your vantage point, like, you know, are people are you seeing a lot more new new Bitcoiners come in or like, what, you know, are they buying Bitcoin? Are they are they do they keep it on custody? I mean, I don't know. Just what insights do you see uh, from, from your yeah. seat at Swan about the way this market is playing out right now? Yeah, I mean, um, coming into January, I mean, Swan's seen um, record trading volumes, basically, and, and new interest and new demand. And personally, uh, you know, Corey said something like the the ETF multiplier effect. It's just this idea, like people have talked about it, but it's just like a new top of funnel. There's just more interest in this. And it's it's traditional financial institutions, the largest, most credible ones, now educating their clients about the merits of owning Bitcoin. And, you know, a percentage of those people, maybe they're going to buy the ETF and it's more accessible, it's convenient. But as they keep learning about it, you know, it's my belief that a portion of those are going to want to buy spot Bitcoin. And so you are seeing uh, from everyone I talk to into the industry, it's not just Swan, it's really any of these Bitcoin brokerage companies. They're seeing like a ton of new demand after the these ETFs along with the price rise, obviously. And um, I think we're going to continue to see that multiplier effect because you know, spot Bitcoin offers advantages to an ETF. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, obviously it doesn't have annual fees, but there's also <laughs> a bit of like capital efficiency. I guess, I yeah. guess there's no fees right now anyway. Well, you can, but like, and you can use okay. the Bitcoin. You can spend it. On well, that's the what I mean. The capital. Fee, yeah. You can exact, use exactly. Bitcoin. Right. Like I yeah, can't send there's you no those shares risk. for, yeah, I can't send you those shares for payment like over a global instant settlement network, no matter where I am. Right. Like, yeah, that's all. So, yeah. That's all. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think there's no good counterparty point, though, like, risk. The, and, yeah. Right. There's no counterparty risk. And the top of the funnel does some of the heavy lifting on getting people interested. And then exactly. the sales pitch is now a little different. It's sort of like that's the top of the funnel. And now the spot Bitcoin companies go and explain, well, wait a second, like you're only getting half the the, the deal with Bitcoin. You should actually. Yeah, get there's going to be like a yeah. portion. Right. But like the amount of flows that the ETFs have seen the interest. I mean, even if it's a, you know, percentage of that that goes like, hey, I actually want to own at least some, you know, some spot Bitcoin. That's still significant in terms of, uh, you know, the increased demand. And so I think that's going to continue with the ETFs. It's just like a different top of funnel. It's a better top of funnel than before, um, where it was a yep. little bit more confusing. I think like you kind of went in there yourself, but now we have like handholding from, from um, you know, the ETF providers out there uh, who are very credible institutions who are, are now educating their clients about Bitcoin. And so they're doing the heavy lifting, like you said. And so we're seeing that. And then like a lot of our clients take self-custody. I mean, I think that's part of the education that we do, but um, 
it's a it's a very high percentage of our clients who take self custody of their Bitcoin off off the platform at Swan, which is what we want to see. Um, yep. You know, we want them taking self custody. That's good for them to use Bitcoin as it's meant to be used, as well as uh, you know, it's good for the network, in my opinion, uh, to have it more distributed, uh, held by individuals. So. Uh, we see a lot of that. We see a lot of that. And so it's been good. It's been good for the industry. I think, I think bull markets, you know, all, all boats rise a little bit too. I think that's part of what's going on, but I think the ETFs are a big part of it. Awesome. Sam, tell the audience uh, where they can find you uh, online and, uh, and, and how to stay in touch. Yeah. I mean, I'm on X all the time, like the rest of Bitcoin uh, industry, it seems like. Uh, you can catch up. Shocker. Um, find Sam Callahan on X.com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's at Sam Calla, S-A-M-C-L-A-L-L-A-H. Um, I post I, I post, like, post like market updates um, on the Swan blog. It's at Swan Signal. So sometimes I'll just uh, share my thoughts about something that's interesting going on in the macro or the Bitcoin industry. And it's like a, usually like a 10 to 12 minute read with charts and stuff. So you can uh, check that out from time to time. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. And then check out Swan Signal. It's a, my podcast that I host. I was going to say, check out Swan Signal. It's a great podcast. Um, and Sam Callahan, Senior Analyst at Swan. Thank you so much for coming on Galaxy Brains, my friend. Thanks, Alex. Always a pleasure. That's it for this week's episode of Galaxy Brains. Thanks for listening as always. And thanks to our guest, Bimnet of EB from Galaxy Trading. And our guest, Sam Callahan, senior analyst at Swan Bitcoin and host of the great podcast, Swan Signal, uh, which I've been on a few times. Thank you, Sam. And everyone who's listening, have a great weekend. We'll catch you next week. Thanks for listening to Galaxy Brains, the weekly podcast from Galaxy Research. If you enjoy the show, please like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. To follow Galaxy Research, sign up for our weekly newsletter at gdr.email, read our content at galaxy.com research, and follow us on Twitter at glxyresearch. See you next week.